Gramza, president of Gramza Capital Management. Gramza, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> how are you? I'm doing very well. How are you doing? How is it in Chicago? Well, it's a little gloomy right now, but uh, it should hopefully be a, another beautiful day. Yesterday was wonderful, a nice fall day in Chicago. The leaves are coming down. Uh, I'm just happy we don't have any snow yet. So right now, it's pretty good. It's the same same story here in Milan. So now, ah. I, I'd like to kick off um, with this uh, major story, uh, specifically mm. the biotech sector, because we do see a major increase when it comes year-to-date performance, or in the past six months specifically, uh, since the, the start of, of the pandemic. Of course, I'm referring to the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. So uh, what's your take on the sector? Do you find it attractive? And then specifically, we're going to talk about Gilead. Well, I think first the sector is because that potential there could be explosive. And when it comes to the latest release, as you just mentioned about Gilead, uh, the response makes sense. Now, the, the issue is going to be how it matures. In other words, we have to go from an idea to the production, to the distribution, to the application of that, that product. And hopefully it's gonna continue getting positive results. That's always the challenge, is how resilient does the market absorb that information? You know, there's always that concern that something just doesn't work for all people. And uh, we may run into that situation, but it's promising. And you know the the world is waiting for something to help, and hopefully this will help, and it will be reflected in the confidence that we see in that stock. Yeah, what's your take on the stock, and what is the chart suggesting? Because fundamentals are a little bit uncertain. They are. I that's the right word to use. It's uncertain. Uh, what we know is the expectation is high that if you and I were long that stock, nothing telling us to sell it, uh, but we need to be cautious. You know, anything, the biotech sector, I'm bullish on, but anything we have at this point in the development of the virus products, uh, we have to be careful because it wouldn't take much to turn it back down. Uh, so then let's have a very quick look at the futures. We do see um, zero reaction actually after the final presidential debate yesterday. I'm sure you you, you, you had um, you checked the debate, right? Yes, I did. So uh, yes, I did. who won the debate in your mind? Well, I don't know if anyone won. I don't know if they've changed anyone's opinion. I think the people who like Trump still like Trump because they felt that he made some good comments. Even though they had this mute button out there, I think he was still able to express some of his ideas. Uh, Biden also laid out his course as how he sees things unfolding. Uh, and I'm sure on both sides there's probably some misstatements. Uh, there's one thing that... Uh, Vice President Biden did make a comment on, he's done this before, and it, and it was brought up, was this issue of fracking. Uh, fracking itself does, and he mentions about it polluting the air, and it, it doesn't do that. Uh, it, it, depending how you're, what you're fracking for, and typically you get natural gas and crude oil. The natural gas, if you have no distribution system for it, they'll flare it. And what that means is you'll see a big tall tower and they have a big flame on top of it. So they're burning it as it comes out. Typically, and, what, and, the, and there's also EPA regulations against doing that. You can only do it so long and then you have to solve that. You have to start capturing it. So the, the fracking process doesn't necessarily pollute and the controls that are in place for that process has been around for a long time. You know, there's over 2 million wells that have been fracked in the world. Uh, we've been fracking wells since 1948. So it, it, it paints an ominous picture around a process that isn't necessarily bad. We have had some problems with earthquakes. That was mentioned in one of the debates. It might have been the first one. 
uh, in Oklahoma. But that's not from the fracking. It's from the injection of the wastewater that's used in the fracking process. And they'd come up with some solutions for that as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that does play out. Uh, renewables, by the way, are growing faster than anyone expected. If you look at the major oil companies like Exxon and Mobil and BP, they're all spending billions of dollars looking at renewables. And they're doing that because they realized over time their demand for their business actually may decrease. But it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to take some time to make this transition. In fact, um, you, you just highlighted it very, very precisely that it's a very expensive transition. So this also might damage the already damaged balance sheet of the companies. Uh, it could. Do, do you it, think it could. this it... might make them less attractive? For example, BP, extremely, um, you know, extremely aggressive movements from the BP. They have um, very, um, I mean, huge targets when it comes to renewable energy, uh, zero carbon uh, policies. But this definitely damaged their balance sheet and not only the stock performance. Well, it, it will have an impact because it changes the expectations of people who trade it. But is it a, is it, does it damage it? I guess that one, I think it obviously remains to be seen, but I think it's a logical transition. Uh, if you're a shareholder, uh, then you want your company to be profitable. You want it to survive. And this idea of accepting that renewables are another way to be involved in the ener energy industry, I think is a logical move. It's just a matter of when companies want to you know, put themselves in that type of business. So how do you explain the fact that we didn't see any reaction, not only from the energy sector, but also the markets after the debate? Uh, well, I because I don't think there was anything new. The things that bothered people about Biden probably still bother people. The things that bother people about Trump probably still bother people. So there wasn't an earth shattering type change, but I think there's still some optimism in the, in the market. Uh, it, it seems the underlying tone from a market point of view is that the Trump administration may continue. Uh, something to look at is those three months, the yield uh, or the returns that we're seeing the three months before the election. If the S&P is up at the end of October, the expectation would be, if you look at statistics, that the current administration would continue. And so it'll be interesting to see over the next couple of weeks, how does the market finish? Do we see that confidence? And I think today we're going to see a positive move in the U.S. markets. I do look for that confidence going into this weekend. So, so you're suggesting that markets are suggesting that Trump is going to be um, Trump is going to win his second term. Is this what you're saying? Well, I I would say yes if, and there's the if, if we get a positive return at the end of this month. In other words, what you'd want to see is the S&P, for example, back at its previous highs. And it's got some work to do that. It's got time to do it, but it's going to have an excuse to do it. And we still have the virus situation hanging out here that can uh, dampen some of that enthusiasm. Well, that's pretty interesting. On the other hand, before we move to the stocks to watch, what is the bond market suggesting? Because we, we do see Treasury yields slightly higher. We were used to see them at 0.5, at 0.6, at 0.7, right now 0.8. I look for that to continue. On the futures prices, I'm looking for weaker uh, uh, bond and 10-year note prices. So I'm looking for higher yields. That That's a positive sign for us. And the reason I say that is that when you see that type of action, it means that bond prices are going down. And if bond prices are going down, it means that money is coming out of bonds. And where does it go? It typically goes towards a stock market. So what you're identifying there, I think is important for growth in the stock market. 
It's the kind of action that we do want to see. And personally, I think that's going to continue. Um, let's move very quickly um, to the foreign exchange because situation over there is also extremely interesting, specifically in the past two to three months when it comes to the greenback. So what is the chart suggesting? Well, I, we're struggling. I, I think the dollar right now, uh, I'm looking for a down close today in the dollar. I'm looking for more of a sideways move next week. I think the euro is firming up a bit. The Swissy is probably one of the stronger European countries that we could look at. Japanese yen, I'm looking for a sideways move. Uh, Australian dollar, I think, is firmed up more than expected. And I look for that to stay strong going into the weekend. British pound, I'm looking for a sideways move. We have the Brexit situation, which has not been resolved. So there's no real strong reason for this market to uh, maintain momentum to the upside. It's more neutral. And the Canadian dollar is also a market. I'm looking for a sideways move, uh, primarily because it's so heavily linked to crude oil. You know, the major resource of Canada is crude oil. And the United States uh, buys their crude oil. In fact, we buy more crude oil from Canada than any other country by far. So for that market to go sideways, that currency, I'm also expecting that same kind of behavior in the crude oil market. Uh, we still have a heavy supply and demand not strong enough situation like you and I have talked about for months. Yeah, totally. But, you, you, you skipped one cross, I shall say, and this is the euro dollar cross. So what's, well, the, what's the target over there? For the euro dollar? Yeah. Uh, 119. 119 to 119.10 would be the expectation within the next two days. So are you, are you how can I say, um, checking also the major stories when it comes to the euro dollar or you just base your analysis on technical analysis? Uh, well, I would say that techni for me personally, technical analysis is the, is the or price action is really the determining factor for me because it's a reflection of how it absorbs those fundamentals out there. I also think fundamentals are important. You know, and if we look at the economic situation of the Eurozone, uh, it's a little shaky and it's understandable. You know, we basically have shut down economies. We're gonna see that type of action. We still have that Brexit situation, which also has an impact on the Euro. But the, now, so that's the fundamentals. But the price action that we're seeing is if you look at today's action, we broke lower in the Asia session, but we've actually come back in the European session. And I do look for that to continue. I'm, what's going to be important, if we finish where we are right now, let's say we finish around uh, 19 or 1860, uh, by the close of Tuesday of next week, we want to be closing above 19, 119 even. And the reason for that is technically, at that point, the euro would be in an uptrend. Well, that's definitely very interesting. And um, are we supposed to avoid a sterling? What are you suggesting to, um, to all the traders or, or even intraday traders that are watching us right now? Well, I would say this, there's a big challenge there. I mean, why we, we saw the British pound firm up two days ago, and I really didn't understand why it did it then, other than optimism that a deal could be reached. And it also may have been dragged along from these other currencies moving. Uh, it needs a resolution. The British pound needs an excuse to do something. So for t example, today, I don't look for a big move in the British pound unless we get new news to drive it. Uh, so I'm looking for a fairly quiet day in that market. And so for a day trader, I think if you're looking to take a little out of that market, your expectation should be a little move, not a big gigantic move uh, like we saw just a few days ago. So uh, let's, touch upon, um, let's touch upon the gold. Is it a hedge or a speculative instrument? Uh, gold is another market that it should react to uncertainty. 
you know, I, from my point of view, gold is a market that is based upon perception. It's not based upon supply and demand like you and I were talking about with crude oil or if we were looking at corn. It's a market that's really based upon the perception of value. And if you think about all these things that have been happening out there, uh, gold has really gone sideways. And I, it, it surprises me, actually, because the virus situation, some uncertainty we see in the stock market, and we also have a dollar that's weaker. A weaker dollar favors gold in general. And right now, we're not seeing gold respond. It's basically a sideways move. We see that also in silver. So I'm neutral to bullish on those markets. Um, I'd like to move to the um, single stocks because we have um, just a few minutes more. And in particular, I want to talk about Tesla because it's been quite interesting in the past a uh, few months is, is a movement. I mean, if we have a look at the chart specifically here to date, we, I mean, the only thing that comes to my mind is, wow, I mean, uh, it's almost 700% higher in just one year. Correct me if I'm mistaken. So um, first of all, I want to start with a very basic um, question. Where, where do they put Tesla? Is it a tech company? Is it uh, an energy company? Or is it an automotive company? That is a great question. I don't know the answer uh, <laughs> because it is such a highly diversified company. It, it's, it has this unique person running the show, uh, a unique person that, and I say that because of the ideas that are generated. It, it's one thing to think about something. It's another thing to turn it into action. And this is a person that turns ideas into action. Uh, the idea of SpaceX, uh, of sending up a rocket back to the Space Center and be able to recover parts of it. Uh, people said that couldn't be done. And when the government allocated contracts, they gave half of the amount to Musk, to Tesla, because he said he could do it much cheaper. And he did. You know, I mean, so the, the car, if you look at its production in China, it's been amazing, although they are re recalling 30,000 cars because of some small technical issue. But it, it's a very unique company, you know, and it's that's why to say where does it fit, it really fits in a lot of different areas. So it's a fairly diversified equity. It is definitely a diversified equity because it's very difficult to answer the question. Probably it's something like a hybrid between all of these three sectors that I just mentioned. I just wanted to uh, bring a very quick correction. So far here today, Tesla, Tesla stock is up about 408%. It was 600%, but before the sell-off that we saw last month. So, so mm -hmm. far we're... 408.92% higher um, year to date and one year 610%, 610.41% to be uh, precise, of course, uh, because we're talking to the viewers. Uh, so, so Dan, so far we were used to see Tesla as a fade story, not as a balance sheet story, but then we saw five, we saw five consecutive, um, you know, quarters of earnings. Do you believe this changed Tesla's history? Well, I think that the fact that they have accomplished some things has now increased the confidence that something really could come out of this. People being skeptical, I think, is very reasonable. You know, until something's really proven, you don't know what you have. You know, can they have interesting ideas, but can they really execute on those ideas? Well, he's shown there's some possibilities that that could happen and i think that's why we're seeing that response to tesla like oh my gosh this person's actually doing something so uh to see further movement to the upside wouldn't be surprising if they keep this momentum on their accomplishments going uh, so final stock to watch um, is intel which is making major movements in in pre-market trading this is all after the yesterday's earnings that we saw they were a little bit disappointing but not 
too much. So do you believe this minus 10.41% is a little exaggerated? And of course, your, um, you, you know your take on the chart. Well, on the chart, I think if we can get back up above uh, 5420, uh, if we can close above that range, if we get above 5420, I think we should be closing near 55. Uh, the reason is what you just said. We're seeing weakness today in that stock, uh, so it's selling off. Are we going to see follow through to the downside now? Is Monday going to take it further to the downside? Today's action implies that. But I think we need to be careful here. Uh, if we think about the industry in total, uh, this reaction to it kind of surprises me. You know, we have so many people working from home. We have so much increase in demand on technology and computers and the things that they're involved in that you would expect that demand to help sustain that stock. So I'm cautious on the short side of that and I'm looking for a movement back possibly next week. So I'm neutral to potentially bullish on that stock. All right. Thank you very much. Dom Gramza, President Gramza Capital Management. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great weekend, Dom. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. Have a wonderful weekend as well. Yeah, you too. Hope to talk to you very, very soon. Me too.